بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم which is the, the concept of tahara, pure, purity, and it ties directly into, as parents, as elders, as uh, uncles, fathers, grandfathers, brothers, in the community, men, I should say, in the community, one of our duties is to carry this trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Uh, I mean, this is a duty on men and uh, women as well, but since this is a men's halaqa we're talking about, as a man, what is our duty, especially towards people in our care. Uh, if we have children, nephews, family, friends, or so forth. So it's important to go back to the basics. Um, and one of the scholars in Mauritania, one of the very famous scholars of West Africa, the Sheikh Mohammed Maloud, he, he gave advice to another scholar, and just remember this is scholars speaking to scholars, to review the rules of Bahara, of purity, every two months, every two months. This is for scholars who have spent years studying the subject of purification and who are practicing it. It's not like an obscure section or the rules of fit that are not practiced often, like for example, Hajj. How often do people make Hajj? Maybe once a life. So you're not really practicing those rules on a regular basis. There's stories of, there's a fame, there's a story of one uh, Mauritanian scholar from West Africa uh, because before modern transportation, people had great difficulties to go to Hajj. So if you lived far away from Hajj, very few people from your community made it to Hajj. West Africa was one of those. Crossing the Saharan Desert was, from, for the most part, a death sentence. A death sentence. Uh, brigands and lack of water, lack of food, getting lost, all of those things were, were, were real difficulties. Uh, our teacher, Murabat al-Hajj, he made the trip to Hajj from West Africa, Mauritania, to Mecca, and his round trip was three years. Three years, he went by foot. Um, uh, going there, he spent about six months there. Because imagine you get there a few months before the Hajj season, and then you have to wait for it, and then you travel back. So his, his trip was, uh, was three years total. So that was the reality that they lived in. Well, one of the, one of the things that came about of that, through that is that they didn't practice the rules a lot. So there's a story of one Mauritanian scholar who went to the Hajj, uh, and the first thing, imagine, they don't even have pictures of the Kaaba. So imagine the, the shope and the, the desire to see the Kaaba that they had, and they go and they see the first time they see the Kaaba. They've never seen a picture, maybe never even seen a drawing of it. And so as soon as he saw the Kaaba and he's in the masjid, he feels so overwhelmed, he wants to greet the Kaaba in the proper way and starts doing it. He was about to do his two rakats. Now this is a scholar who's about to greet the masjid. Is this the proper way to greet the masjid? In any other masjid it is, but the sunnah for the Kaaba is Tawaf, to go around Tawaf. So before he started, just a, a commoner from Mecca came up and said, Ya Sheikh, Tahiyyah to Masjid Mecca to Tawaf. He reminded him that Tahiyyah for, for Mecca is Tawaf. Oh yeah, that's right. He realized it as a scholar, but because he's not practicing it, the commoner who was practicing it often knew the rule ruling through application more than the scholar who had only studied it maybe from a theoretical or hypothetical standpoint. Does that make sense? So, so the rulings that we're doing on a regular basis, it becomes second nature to us. And bahada, purification, and getting ready for prayer and so forth, that's one of those rules. But here is this scholar advising another scholar that those rules that you're familiar with, review them every two months. Does that make sense? Like the, the importance is, so if he's saying about those rulings, review them every two months, then what about those rulings that don't occur regularly. So, and it ties in directly into Ramadan, preparation for Ramadan. Um, some cultures have this as an issue, other cultures may or may not, but one of the things that I, I, I saw growing up, there, I grew up up until the third grade, I was in Jordan. And I remember seeing a lot of people, almost everybody fasted. Everybody fasted. But did everybody pray? Mm, maybe not. Um, and I'm not saying that's uh, whole scale, but that's in general, that was a that was that was an issue. People are like, I will never stop fasting. And sometimes people hold on to certain elements of the deen. I remember a friend of mine telling me that he went to uh, lunch one time with a person and they brought a pizza and the pizza had pepperoni on it. He's like he told the, the waiter, he's like, No, 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 I'm Muslim. 
I don't eat pork. Please take it back and bring us a pizza with no pork. And then after it left the table, he picked up his beer and took a sip. So like what happens in that? The person like he, he or she like makes one element of the deen super important and then disregards other elements of the deen. Um, I remember on my first trip to Mauritania, I was sitting, I was on a plane and it stops in Mauritania and then it goes to Mali. So there was people from, there were French people, there were French people, Mauritanians and, and people from Mali as well. So there was this lady sitting next to me um, and it was funny too, she was wearing a shorter skirt and when I sat down next to her, this is many years ago, but she took a blanket and covered up her, 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 her legs, I guess, out of high, out of modesty. Like, she was fine before I sat down, but when I sat down next to her, she looked dead. So then during the, um, the, the course of the, the flight, she was, um, uh, she had, the food came, and she had her wine. And so, um, and uh, I said, you know, we, we were talking, we had a, she was asking, what are you doing in West Africa? And, you know, I, I was kind of out of place in West Africa, so, so I was telling her I'm going to study in a traditional school and so on and so forth. Then when the food came, I said, sister, why are you drinking the wine? She's like, well, you know, I drink the wine, but um, I don't drink the pork. I don't eat pork. Like, at least I don't eat pork. Now, this is the opposite of the other person. And so what I told her, I said, you know, if, if, you know, both things should be left, but if you're going to leave something, it's more important to leave the wine. She's like, no, no, no. Pork is, is more how I was like, no, 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 the alcohol is more haram. Because it affects your intellect, it, could, it affects your prayer, you're not able to pray, or you pray, you're not able to focus. Nobody commits uh, crimes under the influence of pork, right? But do they commit the influence under, uh, uh, crimes under the influence of alcohol? It's one of the biggest sources of, of crime. It's one of the hidden costs of, of, of alcohol in this country. You know, people say, oh, free trade and free economy and freedom and democracy. But those alcohol companies, what should happen is they should be responsible for the the, the unintended co cost of alcoholism, all of the hospitalizations. Why do we have to cover that as taxpayers? The crimes that are, and then we, and then we hide, house those criminals, and then all of those effects, all of those costs of alcohol, we as a, as a nation, we bear that financially and through our community, they don't. Or gambling, in one state, I think the cost of the, 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 the gambling in Georgia is something like $200 million. The cost to like, the, the incarceration that happens because a lot of gamblers, they start stealing, and you know, there's all these other hidden costs of gambling where they're like, well, just, you know, we're responsible for just selling the tickets or selling the, 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 the slot machines and so forth. So, in any case, alcohol, there's a lot of hidden costs of it, and it's worse than eating pork. But she was having a hard time understanding that. So one of the things that we have to do for ourselves is make sure that we have a, a balanced understanding of the dean, and that doesn't happen in our lives. I saw when I was in Mauritania, when Ramadan came around and we went down to the, to the city, I saw all these people eating food in the daytime. And you ask some of the people and they'll say, well, I'm sick and I'm not able to fast and so forth. But everybody prays. So see, it's the opposite. In one country, I don't know, when you were in Jordan, did you notice that? Were you there during Ramadan? Did no, you know? not in Ramadan. Oh, you were in Ramadan, okay. Um, has anybody noticed that from another country, like where they, they know people that are adamant about not leaving the fast, but they won't pray, or the opposite? Um, so there's a, there's a funny story where uh, this Mauritanian scholar traveled to Morocco. And he went, and when he went to Morocco, he came to this Quran school. And when he went to the Quran school, he saw this nice chef, and he's teaching the children, and then Duhu time comes in. So the Mauritanian scholar gets up and he does his wudu, and he prays Duhu. He doesn't say anything because he doesn't want to have bad trip with the chef. He just he waited a little bit when he saw the chef wasn't praying. He's like, okay, maybe the chef has an excuse and he's going to delay his book of prayer a little bit. I'll just go ahead and pray at the beginning of the time because it's sunnah to, to pray as soon as you can. So then he waited, he waited, and he saw a book of time went out. And now his hostel man is wearing out. He's like, uh, maybe the chef has an excuse, but it's like, and then Asr, and then Asr time, and then he gets up and prays, the Mauritanian prays Asr. Moroccan scholar, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Asad as well. Now the sun goes down, now you have no excuse, right? Like maybe, the, you know, there was some room for Dhuhr and Asad. The sun goes down, no. So he said, Shit, what's going on? You know, you're sitting here teaching Quran all day to these children, but you don't pray? It's like, oh, I don't pray. And he said, why not? You're a Shit, you're, you know, teaching the Quran, the Book of Allah, and so on and so forth. He said, look, he said, just like Allah has divided risk in the world, sustenance, right? Some people have desert, some people have snow, some people have this. He said, the ma'asi, the sins, 
that human beings uh, commit have been divided amongst people. He says, so you in Mauritania, you put your people never leave the prayer, but murder is rampant amongst you, which is true. <laughs> and he said, us, we don't murder people in tribal conflicts because they have like um, inter, like ma'arik of the like like if two people get in a fight, the chance that it becomes a tribal conflict is very high. I've seen it with my own eyes. Like people are very like it's uh, it, you can see that tribal mentality. So he says, you you're tribulated with intertribal conflict and wars and fighting and bloodshed that happens before that. We don't have that, but we have the, the tribulation of leaving the prayer. <laughs> so it's not an excuse, but it's an interesting like sociology, the sociological you know analysis. We have to look at the cultures that we're in and see what has our culture really like given importance to and what it has it not. But then our job as Muslims is we're not defining things by the culture, we're defining things by the deen. So we have to kind of bring some balance back into that. So now as we prepare for Ramadan, in preparing our children and our families for fasting, the important thing is that, that it, 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 it's, it's balanced as well. We prepare them, we prepare ourselves and our families for fasting, but also for the prayer as well. And that's how I'm, how I'm looking at the two together. Um, when we, and then when we talk about it, one of the things that, that's important to realize is that even though we have the five pillars, you know, the shahada, the fast, the salah, so on and so forth, there's actually, they're actually graded. Some are more important than others. So out of the five pillars that Islam rests upon, when you have Islam had a khams, like in the hadith Jabi, Islam was built upon five things. Doesn't mean that's the only things, but those are the pillars of Islam that are built on. What is, what is the most important of those five? Shahada. Right? Shahada. Because without the Shahada, yes? But I've heard they uh, talked to one of the chefs and uh, he went over the same topic. Yes. Let's go to topic and the reason why he mentioned the prayer is because during your prayer you do Shahada. Yeah. That's true. You say the shahada, uh, but so I guess you could say, you know, the, the shahada has the element if you actually believe in the shahada. Because there's people, there are non-Muslims who will pray. Has anybody ever seen this? Yes? Did you see that? There's a person named Houston Smith. He's a very famous writer on world religions. I don't know if he's still living or not. But he has a book called World Religions, and he prays five times a day sometimes. But he doesn't, he's not a Muslim, he's a Methodist or uh, another denomination of Christianity. So he'll pray. He looks at it as a meditation. Uh, there was a sister actually through the women's halakha here. They were talking about the importance of praying in public. Like one of the field trips the girls are taking right now for one of the groups on the girls' halakha is they took them to Barnes and Nobles. And anybody's daughter goes to the, your daughter went there. So at first I thought like, oh yeah, are they uh, are they going for just like you know read some books, buy some coffee, whatever? And they said no. The main point is that we're taking the girls there so that when mother time comes in, they're going to pray in public. And it's a very important exercise because there's a lot of people, children and adults included, that will allow the um, uh, the embarrassment, I guess, of praying in public to prevent them from praying at all in public. They'll say, oh, I'll just make it up when I go home. And so it's a, it's a training exercise to get them comfortable with, yeah, if you're in public, doesn't matter what other people say or, oh, why are they putting their heads on the ground? You know, you, we have to get over that inhibition and be able to do that. There was one sister here um, in the sister's halakha. She was listening to that lesson a few months ago. And so she, and she was leaving the prayer in her office space because of something similar like that. And so she started praying in public. And so a non-Muslim lady in the office started walk, coming by. She's Christian. And she later on, she said, can I join you? You just look so peaceful when you do that. So she started praying with her. She's not Muslim. But that might be her role to Islam. But just think about that. If our... If our inhibition of praying in public, it could harm not only ourselves, it could harm other people. Like, what if that was a way, there's, there's many people who their path to Islam was because they saw somebody pray. Um, there's a sister, does anybody know Uzma uh, uh, Hussein? Sister Uzma Hussein? She was part of the ING network and giving talks, and she was very involved in the, uh, the Zaytuna, uh, still is involved in the, 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 the Zaytuna Institute and in the college. Uh, but she did. A, she performed a lot in one of the high schools, and and when and when she went into sajda, there was one girl in the classroom, a high schooler. That's when then her 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 belief in Islam entered her heart. She was overcome, 
And the reason why is because she said as a, as a devout Christian, she reads in multiple places in the Bible, and he fell on his face in prostration. And he fell in his face, and you know, and so and so fell in their face in prostration. But which church do they ever see that? They never see that. So when they see a Muslim fall on their face in prostration, they're like, that's what I read about in the Bible. And so she was so overcome, she became Muslim because of that. Now imagine if somebody's like, well, you know, and, and the floor is dirty, and what would they say, and you know, would they whispers and so forth, and then cause that to prevent them from being able to do that. So, um, that's the, the importance of prayer, uh, importance of praying in public. Um, so we're we're working to bring that balance back in the in the in the in the, um, uh, in the so in the five pr pr the prayers. So okay, that's how I got into that. There are non-Muslims who will use the prayer as a form of meditation, but the shahada is a um, a precondition of the validity of that prayer. Because if somebody still believes in idols, what happens? You know, is this, does the sense account? When the Prophet ﷺ, when Surah Al-Najm was revealed to him, one Najm ida hawa ma'abun nasahibukum wa ma'abawa in the whole entire Surah. At the end of the Surah, because it came down to the Prophet while he was at the Kaaba, <coughs> at the end of the Surah, what if Quraysh who was hearing this, the revelation come down, what did they do? They went into sajda. They all went into prostration. And so some of the, the idol worshippers who had not embraced Islam, they asked them, are you prostrating to the God of Muhammad? They said, no, we're just prostrating because of the eloquence, the, the amazing eloquence of this of this surah. So people will prostrate for different reasons. So what we have to do is we have to say, okay, what's the most important thing? So out of the, 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 the five pillars, the most important is the shahada, iman. That's like a, a, um, a business person, that would be your capital. Everything else is a profit, is profit. Um, what's the next one after the shahada? Salah. Then after the Salah, what comes? Zakah. Now if you look, some people might, you know, some maybe you hesitate, what's next? Think about in the Quran, what is always benched in with the Salah? With the Salah. With the, what's that? No, with this one. Wa'atimu Salah. Wa'atimu Zakah. Wa'atimu. Al-Ladhinu Ayyadhi Surah Al-Baqarah. Alright, it starts off. The description of the believers is what? Believe, which is expressed through the shahada. And they establish the prayers. And then what? And from what we have given to them as, as sustenance, they spend the zakat. So zakat is next. And this is why, this is why when after the Prophet passed away, many of the tribes of Arabia that had become Muslim recently, what did they do? They didn't say we leave Islam. They just said we used to give our zakat, the zakat that Muhammad had uh, made an obligation, we used to give it to him. We're not going to give it to his khalifa. That, that, that uh, oath was with Muhammad, not with you, Abu Bakr. And so then Abu Bakr did what? What's that? He fought them back. He fought them. The Ridda Wars. And a lot of the Sahaba questioned him, including, most interesting, Omar. Radiallahu who was the first, like when somebody insulted the Prophet, what if Umar was around, what did he do? Grab his sword. Rattle this one person, he started, he just rattled his sword and made the person so scared. The Prophet actually told Umar he shouldn't have done that and then made Umar pay him some money as like a, a fine. Like you scared this believer. You brought fear into his heart because you're Umar and you just rattled your sword. That scares him. Uh, one, one time uh, Abu Huraira was, uh, was with the Prophet and they were by themselves. They were in one of the gardens of Medina. And the only way to get in there was through this little um, uh, hole in the wall. And so Umar, he saw, he saw Abu Huraira coming out. He's like, what's Abu Huraira coming out of the, this wall? like it's out of the ordinary. And then he's holding the sandals of the Prophet He's like, why does he have the sandals of the Messenger of Allah? So he stopped him. Abu Huraira, what's going on? You know, it's out of, out, of, out, of, out, of, uh, out of the ordinary. And he said, these are the sandals of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he told me to take them, and that whoever I first see to uh, give glad tidings to them, that if they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, they will enter Jannah. And so Umar pushed him back and stopped him. He said, wait. 
And he said he, he pushed him so hard, and the way he stopped him with his firmness, the hadith mentions, he says, the tears welled up in Abu Huraira's eyes. And for those of you who are, who are parents, you know, before your children, like if they start crying, before the tears come, you know how it like goes, it just breaks your heart, like you, you can imagine that, right? The, the tears just fill up in the eyes. They don't start, uh, they said it welled up in his eyes because he stopped him with so much force. And he said, uh, Abu Huraira, he said, if you tell the people this, if you tell them this, they will, uh, they won't give importance to actions, right? Just think about if a person like some faiths, if they're like, oh, faith is enough for me. Every, all my sins will be forgiven. All I have to do is believe. Some Muslims have this, right? They're like, I'm a believer. If you say, brother, why don't you pray? Sister, why don't you pray? Why don't you give zakat? Why don't you do this? Why don't, oh, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm a believer. You ever heard somebody say that? Like, alhamdulillah, I have you now. So Umar real knew this about the psychology of human beings. If they thought faith was enough, it's going to cause a problem. So he stopped him. Then they both went back to the Prophet sallallahu and then the Prophet sallallahu said, yes, Abu Huraira, don't tell this to the people. Now somebody might mention this in their life. Umar is like stopping the wahi. But this is one of the instances of what's called the muwafaqat of Umar, which are the, um, what's a good translation for the muwafaqat? The, 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 um, the, the synchrony that Umar had, and he didn't have wahi, because wahi and revelation only comes to the prophets. But he had a deep understanding of the Sharia, that of this deen, that when he heard something, it, it was in sync with what was eventually going to happen. So, so part of the the wahi was supposed to come. But uh, the Prophet ﷺ told that to to um, to uh, Abu Huraira. Umar had that interaction, and then the Prophet abrogated what he had said, which is possible. He can he can he can. He's not he's contradicting himself. It's not that he's going back on his word. It's that he's abrogating what he had said. Uh, there's other instances when, when the, the, the lie was told about Aisha radiallahu anha, that if, you know the first thing that uh, Umar said, the first thing that came out of his mouth when he heard that if, subhanaka hadha buhtan al which is the same wording that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose when he described the if, hadha buhtan al in the Quran. So Umar's choice of words matched up to what Allah was going to give in revelation. Not that what Umar said was revelation. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, so here's an instance of where um, uh, Umar is, is, is trying to, 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 to help in those priorities. So we have, okay, so okay, that's how it, so Umar had a harsh tendency. When Abu Bakr made this decision to do the Ritter Wars, Umar said, Abu Bakr, why are you doing this? Like this is Umar, you're the... You rattle the sword, you tell people, if they insult the Prophet, let me make my sword his necklace. That's you, Omar. You, you know, this is what you, you stopped Abu Huraira, made the tear. You're telling Abu Bakr to stop the the war? So he came to Abu Bakr and said, you know, don't do these wars, the people are new to Islam. He said, they became Muslim, and they said that part of their Islam was to believe in Allah, to establish the prayer, and I will not distinguish between something that Allah did not distinguish between. In the Quran, Allah always said, aqimu salah, you know, aqimu salah He said, if Allah didn't make a distinction between those two, why should I, Abu Bakr, say, okay, it's okay for you as Muslims to just pray, but not give zakat. And so he did the famous riddah words. And that's actually what, what maintained the, uh, the ummah for the later expansion that happened during the khilafah of Umar. Okay, so we have the shahada, the fasting, the, the zakat, then what? The reason why it's not clear is because that's the same thing with the ulama. They, they don't know. Is hajj more important or is fasting more important? Like what is the tafdeel of it? The prayer, it's clear. It's mentioned first in the Quran. Um, it's also, we just passed uh, by Isra al Mi'raj. Every single obligation that we have to do as Muslims was given to us through the Prophet while he was here on earth. But the obligation of the prayer came where? Sidrat al-Muntaha, at the farthest point, direct revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet during that journey. There was a lot that was going on in that journey. So one of the things that we can tell our, our children when we encourage them to pray is not, oh, pray, why? It's fun. And if you don't do it, it's haram. You're a sin. Burn in hell. You know, like that kind of, you have to say, like, look at what Allah gave us. He gave us this prayer. One of the things I just shared with the, the, the youth halaqa over there at the gym. I said, the, the, even the emotions of our prayer, 
Do we know where we got that? Like, why do we do standing a little cool or coming up, and then there's a set them, and there's a set? Why do we do it in that format? It's because on the night of Isra and Mi'raj, when the Prophet ﷺ went to the furthest Sidrat uh, al-Muntaha, before that he sees all of the angels that are worshipping Allah. Some of them, they're created and all they do is sajda. That's it. Some of them, all they do is rukur. Some of them, all they do is they stand. So the prayer of the angels was all in these different positions that we see in our prayer. The Prophet ﷺ asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, all of those different forms of the angels praying, I want that in my prayer for my Allah. That's what we have. So when you when you put that in, it helps put it in perspective, even for ourselves, like what is like we're not just going through these motions. There's 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 secrets and there's meanings behind these motions. And that's one thing that we can help our children as they grow. Even we can even help ourselves. Like why is it so important? Uh, so then we have, um, so then there's fasting and hajj. Uh, we don't know, you know, which one is, is greater. We have to be doing all five, but it's just which one is, is afba, uh, which one is more uh, superior. So as we come into Ramadan, and now the whole household is gearing up for preparations of Ramadan and getting ready for, for Ramadan, and okay, where are we going to get, uh, you know, your, your kids and your family are hearing conversations, okay, how are we going to do tarawih? Are we going to switch off if we have kids? You know, are we going to take them to the masjid and get lost in our prayer while our kids are running around the masjid, you know, destroy, or destroying property and and and, uh, and uh, uh, disturbing other people while we're in the front of the line, you know, getting closer to Allah? It's since the sarcasm in my voice, right? It's better for a person to switch off with their spouse. Like, think uh, practically. You don't have to come and drop your kids off at the masjid, you know. If your kids can't do 20 rakahs, you know, maybe leave after 8. It's better to, uh, to, to, to do things that is not going to be uh, cumbersome on you or switch off with the spouse. You know, start thinking strategically. Which masjid are we going to pray? How are we going to do tarawih? How are we going to do meals? So on and so forth. Um, so as your family sees this planning, they should also see that the prayer is not neglected, especially in Ramadan. Because we see here at the masjid, tarawih. Inshallah, right? We have, we, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's uh, standing room, there's not standing room only, there's not, there's not even standing room, right? But what happens after Ramadan? The masjids are empty. And we know that one thing that happens is that some people, they will go to Tarawih prayer, but they're not praying five times a day. And we know people who do that? So what's going on in that person's mind? You know, what is going on in that person's mind? Uh, one thing that can help us bring balance to that is a statement of Umar He said that leaving one dirham because it's haram, like if there's a there's an interaction, a business interaction, a sale, a transaction, cheating somebody, theft, whatever type of whatever makes this one silver dirham haram, not taking that dirham that's haram is better than seventy thousand rakahs of nafi. Or 70,000 Umrahs. Now think, he's, he's given us a very like vivid I I image, right? So now imagine you're, you're, you come and you see a person who's like, he just gets, he just gets finished with like 70,000 Rakhahs here. And he's like, he had a counter. Imagine the like magnificence of that. Like, he's just finished 70,000 Rakhahs. But he took a dirham that was haram. He's like, look, I know, I know I took that dirham, I know I did this transaction, it was haram, but I've done all these nafila prayers. What's going on with that person? And why is Umar saying that leaving that one dirham is better than those 70,000? Why? Because you're taking someone else's property. Okay, you're taking somebody else's property. But what's the what's the diff the defining difference between those two actions? The magnitude, but okay, so why, why, what is it in the, in the magnitude? The 70,000 rakas, that's huge, right? One, why is this one bigger? One is more daily ritual versus one, is, one can have a larger community. Okay, that one has a larger effect. Those are all, those are all reasons behind the ruling, but what's the ruling of those two? The, so those, what, what you were saying is actually like reasoning behind why this one is worse than this one, but what's the ruling of those two items? Exactly. And the nafila? Do exactly. They're not stealing or not taking the haram, that's a farm. And this is a nafi. And um, uh, and so leaving the farm, you know, I mean, fulfilling the farm of not stealing 
and staying away from the haram, you have to do that. You don't have to do the 70,000 nafilas. If somebody came to Allah and didn't do one nafila in their entire life, can they be put in the hellfire for that? They can. The famous Bedouin man who came to the Prophet and he said, tell me about Islam. He said, Islam is the Jew. And he mentioned the five prayers. And when he mentioned, he said, if I only do this, I don't detract or increase from this. The, just the basic zakat, the basic one hajj. No umrah, no multiple hajjs, all that. Uh, will I go to, uh, you know, is that enough? He said, yes. And then he left. And the Prophet said, what did he say to the companions? If you want to see a man of paradise, look at this man. So what that establishes for us is that even though we all were talking about the sunnah and the importance of the sunnah, the baseline that we always have to remember is that as long as we do the fub, we're good. That's the most important thing. So when it comes to like a choice between I'm going to use, imagine the energy and the time it would take to pray, even say, not even 70,000, 700 of our of Nafila, right? There's a, there's a cost associated with that. There's money that you're not getting because you're not working. There's time that you're not with your friend. Weigh that cost against the cost of what would it cost you to stay away from this one bill? And that's the balance that we would make. But why is it <clears throat> that human beings, like for example, I'll give you one, one example. There's a ruling that's mentioned if a person, well, let's start with this. When does a person have to start praying? What's that? Puberty. Puberty, right? Once a person hits puberty, now it's a fog upon them to not pray. Well, some people don't start praying regularly until they're in their late teens or their 20s or their 30s, sometimes in their 50s or their 60s. What happens with all those other prayers that they miss? What happens? They're not praying. What's that? Not for you. Well, yeah, the nephil does fulfill if you miss the fun, <clears throat> but that's for like on Yom al Qiyamah for the things that you didn't know about. But if you know that you missed the fun, like say say somebody for whatever reason went to sleep in Asr and woke up right now and said Isha, went to sleep and woke up and missed the Muffin. Before they pray Isha, what should they be doing? Allah <laughs> prayer. There was one time after the battle of, um, of Bedr, um, the, the Sahih imagine they were fasting it was on the 17th of Ramadan in the summertime has anybody ever been in, in Mecca or Medina in the summertime it's hot it's probably like what 120s hitting 130 they're fasting and playing, uh, fighting a battle in the middle of the summer in the Arabian desert they're tired at the end of that, that, that battle. so the Prophet told me that wake us up for fidget. what happened to be that he fell asleep overslept they didn't wake up the sahab. They woke up when the sun was beating on their face. So the Prophet ﷺ got everybody up. They traveled a little bit, and then they um, then then they, they, they stopped. They did their wudu. They did iqama. Uh, they did not do any adhan. They did the iqama, and then they prayed as a jama'ah. So this actually establishes a number of rulings, this story. One, that the Prophet just said, oh, we missed it. Okay, alhamdulillah, Allah is ghafur rahim Allah is forgiving and merciful. I was like, no, we, we missed something. We're going to make it up. Not only are we going to make it up, we're going to make it up as a jama'ah. So if you and your family miss fajr, for whatever reason, you can pray it as a, as a jama'ah. The other thing is, he did not do adhan, but he did do iqam. So when we're making up prayers, we can do it as a, as a jama'ah. If we all miss that same prayer, and we can do the iqama, but we have to make it up. So now, this, is, this, this happens with a lot of people when they realize that. They're like, okay, I have years and years and years of years of prayers to make up. It's a huge item. I know one of my shunu, he, uh, when he when he started studying, he made up, I think, five years of prayer. Another person had made up 10 years of prayer. I've heard stories of people making up 40 years of prayer. Anybody hear stories like that? What did you hear about? 30 years. 30 years? And that's, a lot, that's like 30 years, that five times 365 times 30. What is that? A series. Let's just do that. Five times 365 times 30. 54,750 prayers. That's a lot of prayers. And you know, you're having to keep the tally mark and so forth. There's actually these little books, I don't know if they're still available. It's called Debt to the Divine. It's a little tally book, and it's got the, the, the entire track. You just start, you know, marking it marking it away. So now now some of this now the, the question is people ask okay I'm, uh, they first, the first hurdle is 
how am I going to make up all those prayers? They figure it out, you know, do the calculations, make up those prayers. The second hurdle is, um, but what happened, you know, can I still do the Sunnah prayers? And now this is where the scholars differ. Some say that you can do the Sunnahs as long as you're making up your prayers. Other scholars say, no, no, because what's more important, the Sunnah or the Fatah? <coughs> and which one, is, which one is more important? Think about Omar's statement, one dirham, 70,000 nafila. The Fatah is more important than the, than, the, than the Sunnah, not to detract from the status of the Sunnah. So some people will, they'll go to Tarawih and they'll stand, and especially if you go to some masajid that is like two and a half hours, why would somebody stand for two and a half hours in uh, and 20 rakahs, but they say, ah, I don't really have the energy to make up my qadha prayers. Can I just do the sunnah prayers? A lot of people have that. And I remember hearing one explanation, uh, because I've heard this from multiple people. They don't have a problem praying their sunnah. They're like, look, I pray five times now, and I pray every single night for them. And I'm at the masjid, and I'm up at Tehju, and I do the tarawih. Okay, you're doing all these extra. Why can't you make up those other ones? Well, you know... They have a number of excuses. One explanation that I heard, very interesting, was it's because the nafs, the human being, does not like told being uh, does not like uh, being told what they have to do. They always like having a choice in the matter. Think of little kids. Think of ourselves. If somebody tells you to do something. It's different than it's like, would you like to? Oh, sure, you know. Or like little kids will say, if you know, sometimes you tell them to do something. I'm not going to do it. I'll do it when I want to do it. Now I want to do it. And they do it. So the nefs likes having a choice in the matter. Does the nefs have a, do we have a choice in the matter of thought? We don't. Do we have a choice in the matter of sunnahs and nafil and tarawih? We have a choice. And so the nefs is actually inclined like, oh, I have a choice, then I'll do it. But if you tell me I have to make up the thought, the nefs just doesn't want to do that. So you'll have people that'll, that'll have no problem making up extra prayers, but they're not, uh, uh, sorry, doing extra prayers, but not making up both. So that's something that for us to bring balance to our lives and those people that are in our families. If we see somebody that's praying Tarawih, there's a number of, of, um, of ways that they can do it. And the Madah have differ on this, but according to some, like in the Shafi'i school, the Maliki school doesn't allow this, and I don't, uh, I don't know um, uh, the other school, but the Shafi'i school allows a person to pray a fard behind a nafila imam. So when you come to the imam's praying tarawih, that's a nafila prayer. You can you can make up like fajr, fajr, fajr. Just say, just go in behind the imam and say, but this is fajr, you know, fajr. And so at the end, you got ten fajr prayers out of tarawih. So you got you fulfilled that. You got that. Or if you're doing the extra prayers, just tack on some baba prayers with those prayers. I don't want to get into all the fit of that, but the the thing is to to to, to think about how we are prioritizing. Uh, in the in the uh, in the month of Ramadan, I know some of the parents have to go over to pick up the, the boys at, at nine o'clock, um, and I want to leave the last ten minutes open for prayer. And next week, I'll talk a little bit more about the Hara and some Tahara issues that we should be focusing on with our family. But tonight, I just wanted to focus on making sure that as a family, we're not allowing the magnificence of Ramadan to detract, for, to overshadow that overshadow the importance of prayer. Because Ramadan is a very good time to get into a routine. Wouldn't you say you've experienced that? Like the rest of the year, our eating schedules may be off, having dinner with our family is off. You know in Ramadan, suhoor and iftar, you're having with your family, right? For the most part. And so, and it's regular. And it's not like, when's dinner time? Oh, I don't know when the, no, no. Dinner time in Ramadan is pretty clear. When that sun goes down, it's dinner time. Uh, and so we're going to come together as a family. And then we get into a routine. Once you have a routine, it's easier to, uh, to start a habit. Um, and so if we don't have the habit of the five prayers established in our lives, we can use Ramadan to do that. If, if there's other things, and maybe we're doing the five prayers, but we're doing them sloppily or hastily or leaving them till the very end or not putting on the sunnah, whatever addition you want to do, let's use Ramadan, include our families in that, help them, you know, if we're getting up for suhoor, you know, we, most people eat right up until uh, Fajr time. You just wait a few minutes and then pray Fajr and you can go back to sleep. Uh, so it's a good time to get into, into, into routines. Um, and I'll leave the last 10 minutes or so open for questions. So how, so if somebody missed many years of prayer, mm -hmm. how, how do you make it up? So you, you kind of, what, uh, tell me like, I'm going to pray mm -hmm. for which day though? 
Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah. So if a person has made up prayers, how do they do that? You know, do you, what intention do you do, and do you have to have an intention for that exact day? So the scholars have have answered this question. Very good question, Dr. That um, you don't have to have an intention for that exact prayer because that would be impossible, right? You're like January twelfth, you know, nineteen ninety nine. Like no, uh, you just say oh. Um, and it would be better to make them up in the way that they were missed. So you don't do like. 30 years of Fajr and then 30 years of Luhr. You do Fajr, Luhr, Asa, Maghrib, and Isha, and then go, go through those. One of the ways that a person can do that is that you can also just read Fatiha and just read a, a portion of a, of a surah. You don't have to read the entire surah to get the sunnah. So after Fatiha, put the Allahu Ahad, and then you go into your Kuwa. And then maybe normally you do, you try not to do the prayer, you know, uh, surah, fast, and so forth. You try to have Ithmina and tranquility in the prayer. But in the Fala prayers, if you want to make them up, you can, you can do that a little bit. You can uh, say proportion. Portion. 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 Yeah. So, you know, Fatiha, Surah, Purdu Allah, Subhanahu Rabbil Azim, you know, come up and so forth. So you can shorten the prayer. Yeah. So, you know, Rolf, I'm just saying that so many questions come up and then, you know, uh, different uh, ways of. So, what about praying in the Kaaba? Praying inside the Kaaba. Inside, but in the Haram. Yeah. You know? Isn't that like one prayer is like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that question does that. It's like, well, I owe 50,000 prayers. Yeah. I'll make two prayers of Nafila in the Kaaba. It's worth 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's like negotiations, right? <laughs> no, because I've heard some people say, like, you know, they do the 40. Uh, yes. 40 uh, prayers in yeah, Athena. Yeah, or, uh, like, yeah. Yes. And, and so those, those ahadith, so you know, the the, the, the those ahadith, they're, they're important. Like there's there, من صام رمضان إيمان واحتسابن. And then there's another hadith. ستن من شوال. If a person fasts Ramadan and then uh, follows Ramadan with six days of shawal, what is their reward? Full year. year. So now are they going to say, well, I got I got Ramadan and a full year, so I don't have to fast next Ramadan. <laughs> so it's not that that nafida like it removes the obligation of the fard, it's just that he, they get the reward of yeah, that. more credit. It's the, yeah, you get more credit. You get more, uh, uh, more, more credit, but you still have that liability. So they're like this, 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 uh, these. Uh, if they were, if it was a bank, you know, it, the, these assets cannot be used. In, you know, the currency is different. You can't use the euro to fulfill a dollar debt. Uh, but that's a very good question. So that that hundred thousand uh, prayers. Um, and even now, now that, that hadith says that the, the, the prayer in Mecca is worth 100,000, but it doesn't say whether it's nafila or fad. And so even if we say that two rakahs of nafila is worth 100,000, what did Umar say? Which is worth more, the one fad or the 70,000? One fad. One fad. One fad is, is worth more. So, good try. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good question. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question is, what are, what are the rules of praying while in a car? Um, you're traveling, you're not in a hotel, you're not at a rest stop, you know, what do you do? Can you pray sitting down? Um, and this is, this is actually more common, you know, in the last hundred years because of uh, mass transportation, trains, airplanes, and so forth. The Prophet وسلم, did pray, an, uh, uh, pray sitting down while riding on a camel. So we know that. Now the question is, did he pray a fard or a nafid? And when we look at what he prayed, he prayed a nafid. It was, a, it was not a fard prayer. Because the Sahaba were very meticulous in describing what the Prophet did and where he did it. And down to the point, just to give you an idea, one time uh, somebody was traveling with Ibn Umar, عنه, the son of Umar. And he saw Ibn Umar get off the, the, get off the animal that he was riding on, walk over to a tree, sit down, stand up, and come back to the animal that he was riding on. He said, why did you do that? He said, because I was riding with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we were passing through this exact same place and he got off of his animal and he went to that tree and Allah, he, he used the restroom and he came back. But I wanted to do, even though he didn't have to use the restroom, he wanted to follow the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam down to his actions that he did. Down to the point somebody asked him in Umar that he said, why do you wear yellow sandals that have no hair on them? Have you ever seen leather sandals that people 
use the traditional ones that still have the hair, the rawhide on them. Anybody ever seen that before? So the Arabs, what they used to wear, wear was sandals that still had the, the, the hide on them. Ibn Umar did it. He wore uh, hairless leather sandals that were yellow. He said, because I saw the Prophet wear these type of sandals. The ink, so he got down to the color and the style and everything. Um, so that's how meticulous they were. So when, when the Prophet did something, all we have to do is go back and say, okay, this prayer that he prayed on the animal, which one was it? It was, I believe it was Doha prayer. I would have to, I'm not 100% sure, but it was definitely a Nafila prayer. So that's the first thing. So now we get the, the Sunnah of being able to uh, pray sitting down for the Nafila. Uh, but the Fard is not included. The Fard is you have to stand up unless you're, there's no way around it. So examples they give, if somebody's praying on a ship and if by standing up you're going to get really dizzy and fall down, like some people when they travel by plane, this happens to them, that person has a medical excuse not to stand up. Or on an airplane, sometimes they don't allow you. You know, they'll, sometimes they will allow you to get up and stand up and pray, sometimes they won't. So, it, so now you have federal law and regulations and air marshals and so forth, and the company's telling you, look, this is our plane, you abide by our rules, you have to sit down. Sit down. But if you have the option of being able to like pull your car over and stand up, you have to do that. Quran says, stand up. It doesn't say sit down. So the um, um, and this is the ulama of the four madhab are in agreement about this about the obligation of standing um, and that the sitting uh, is, is for sunnah and nafila prayers. So now, now we come to the practical application of that. What do we do? Well, a couple of things. This is where now, when we travel, if we're going by car, we have to kind of like check the prayer times. And especially, you know, we're the driver, we're the helm of the, 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 the and we have our wife and our children and our friends. We have to think about, okay, so it's 50 miles to the next rest stop, there's a gas station here, we delay it, we're gonna miss, you know, you have to do those calculations. And then just pull over, do um, do and, and pray. Um, there's rare instances where a person might be stuck in traffic and there's like, if there's no way out, if there's no way out, then of course a person can sit down and fulfill the prayer. But if there is a way out, then you have to do it. One person who asked me this exact same question, he's like, but what if it's on the uh, the, the freeway and it's very difficult to get out the freeway and this and that, and can, I, can I just pray? I said, if you really had to go to the bathroom, what would you do? Well, I would, <laughs> I would pull over and, you know, I would figure something out. Like, when we're put to the test of being able to figure things out, people come up with them creative ideas. Like, I'll give you an example. You know the dressing rooms in, in malls? I was with my uh, my father-in-law, and that's where he goes. The dressing room. I'm like, perfect place! If you don't want to pray in the mall in some corner, and you don't like people looking at you, which is reasonable, you don't want to play in the parking lot, well, there's dressing rooms. Um, or in the Midwest, where it's very difficult. Like, we have the luxury in California of being able to pray outside any time of year. In the Midwest, I was traveling in Missouri in the wintertime, Try doing sajda on concrete in the winter time, it's like painful, right? So you have to find a place indoors. Um, and so you just figure out creative ways of, of, playing, of, of finding a way to pray. You know, I drive uh, the Uber, and a lot of time I go to the city, and it's really almost impossible. You know, I, I try to find a masjid whenever I can, honestly. And then sometimes if I have time, I just go to Mulbray because there's you know, ample, you know, parking space there. Yeah. A lot of time where you go to masjid inside San Francisco, there's no way you can park. Yeah. It's impossible. A lot of time I did it, it's just like, it, it's waste, you know. Yeah. And then, so I'm stuck in the city. And really sleeping, I mean, praying on the street, it's all, you know, I feel it's unsafe. Yeah. You know, and so in this case. Okay, and, and that's a valid point. You know, if you're, if you're, if, 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 you know, it's unsafe. That's why, we, and I know we're, maybe we can pick this up next week in the Halakha, but it's important to even know the rules of joining between prayers. Um, and, and, and in one, I'll mention this, this is not fetwa shopping. Uh, according to the Maliki school, um, as long as you're outside of your city limits, you can join between the prayers. So if a person's outside and they're, they're going around, I, 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 I'm not going to go into the rules right now. There's specific rules about how to do it, but there's ways, and if you're, especially if you're driving, and even if you, if you drive more than 50 miles, now you're a Musafir according to all of them in that. Um, so it's important to know the rules of travel and joining prayers and shortening prayers and so forth, which we can go to uh, next in the halakha. But what I would say is in the Quran it says, Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will give him a way out. And in English they say, where there's a will, there's a way. There's a way. 
And just now I put it in there, I said, where there's taqwa, there's a way. And Wallahi al if we put it in our minds, like, I, I'll give you, I'll, I'll end on this. One time I was taking a flight, and usually when I buy flights, when I purchase a ticket, what I do is two things. I look at the prayer times of the city of departure and the city that I'm going to, to make sure, if I can, to pray in the airports. Because it's difficult, you know, who's done with an air, uh, airplane? Yeah, you'll be going on. Yeah, it's, all my, it's difficult, right? Getting your foot up in the sink, somebody's banging on the door, and then, just, and then you got to find a place to pray. And so I was thinking a Fajr flight was a red eye, and I was so anxious about, oh, Fajr, you know, how am I going to get Fajr in? Uh, there's an app called Halal Trips, and you can actually calculate in flight, your prayer time's in flight for you. So um, when uh, when I got onto the plane, I said, you know what? I got onto the plane, my seat, it was all three were empty. It's better than having a first class seat, right? So I stayed there when I, it was time for Fajr. I got up, I went to uh, Dubulu, everybody's asleep in the, the plane. I asked the stewardess, because that's one thing. Make sure you ask, because when a Muslim stands next to that exit door on an airplane, gets people nervous. Um, I said, can I make a prayer? It will require me to, to oh yeah, yeah, sure. You can, do we need to get out of your way? Please keep us in your prayers. Like, you know, and, and I said, this is a, and I'll end on this though. I know I said that a couple times. But praying on an airplane, if it's a non-Muslim airline, is much easier. Jordanian <laughs> Airlines, <laughs> Moroccan Airlines, they will tell you that's a Saudi or Saudi Jazz, the Lufthansa, Air France, United Airways, American Airlines. I've traveled a lot. I've never had a non-Muslim stewardess tell me no, you cannot pray standing up on the airplane. They will let me. They let me into their stewardess, the the, 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 the area when they're serving food. They go to the back. They say, can you pray here? Can you wait five minutes? They'll accommodate for you. You ask a Muslim steward on a Muslim airline to pray? Oh my God. Uh, no, you don't need to. Once told my friend, he, uh, told my friend don't, you don't even need to pray. So, I'll end on that. I don't want to turn this into, but. Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will give him a way out. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us taqwa in all of our affairs. And give us a makhraj and